Hey everyone, welcome back to the Dabbler's Den. I'm Chris Cottrell, and this is part nine of my series on the formation of the Carolina Bays. Uh, we've been discussing points of evidence that connect a younger Dryas causing cosmic impact into the Laurentide ice sheet that resulted in the formation of the mysterious eastern land features known as the Carolina Bays. Uh, if this is brand new to you, you know, please take a minute now to click on the link above and watch this series from the beginning. I promise it'll be time well spent and make this video easier to understand. Now, before I get now before I get started, I, I want to take a minute to thank all of you who have shared these videos with other groups of similar interest. Um, I can always tell when one of you shares a video by the surge of new and enthusiastic subscribers. So, so again, I thank you and please, please keep it up. Um, to pay it forward, I want to quickly highlight another YouTube channel run by The Angry Hippie. Uh, he has a fantastic series titled The Species with Amnesia, borrowed from Gra uh, author Graham Hancock. Uh, he digs deep into the philosophical and sociological effects of the very event I've been covering here. And again, it's all about connecting the dots. Um, so you can find this channel by clicking on the link above or looking down in the description below. <sighs> well, some may say that I've saved the best for last year. You know, cultural observance records or myths and legends don't usually stand up as, as fact when it comes to scientific investigation and has largely been ignored in the past, you know, mainly because they can be based on speculation and interpretation. However, the fact that these records were told, they were passed down from generation after generation, and we're still talking about them today is pretty powerful. It needs to be taken into consideration. Um, Earth crossing paths with an, with an approaching comet would have made headline news across the globe. You know, even 13,000 years ago, uh, the buildup would have lasted for months and every single person alive on Earth as witness. Uh, and the disastrous climax would have been an event that no surviving person would ever forget. And they made sure that none of their descendants would ever forget it either. Uh, you know, it may sound silly, but fire breathing dragons, witches on broomsticks, catastrophic floods, the day of the dead. You know, these are all stories that were told around the world, regardless of location and culture. Uh, and they more than likely have the same source. Uh, while North America may have taken the hardest hit, the stories recorded here are no different. Now, before I get into a few specific examples, um, while researching North American cultural observance records for this event, I kept coming across what we now uh, know as swastika symbols. Now, before this symbol was borrowed and tarnished by the German Nazis in the 1920s, uh, the hooked cross was used worldwide as a symbol of good fortune and well-being and has been dated back to nearly 12,000 years. So the timing here does line up. Now here in North America, the Mississippian mound builders use this symbol quite a bit. You know, it's, it's thought and even hypothesized by astronomers Victor Klub and Bill Napier that the ancient symbol may represent the younger driest causing comet itself. You know, perhaps it was indeed the survivors who were lucky enough to live through the catastrophic event. You know, and most of us will recognize the tail or coma of a comet as it makes us pass by Earth from a distance. But if a comet were coming straight towards us, uh, as this one very likely did, you know, the jets of dust and gas would have taken on a spiral shape around the comet's nucleus. Uh, once the comet passed Earth, a little too close for comfort, our orbit crossed paths with the debris field and a few pieces made their way through, through our atmosphere, uh, one of which struck the Laurentide ice sheet at the area we now call Saginaw Bay, making or setting off the catastrophic chain of events that led to the formation of the Carolina Bays themselves. Uh, here are a few examples I borrowed from Jason Pentrell uh, of the Seven Ages research team. Um, I saw this artifact on his Facebook page a few months ago and immediately recognized this one here. Uh, and I immediately recognized the uh, symbol on the hand. Uh, you know, they, they just wrapped up their fall 2018 field trip uh, to a few of the mound builder sites here in the southeast. Uh, and you can hear all about it by clicking on the link above. 
Um, there's even a brief segment with uh, Mr. Randall Carlson himself, uh, which has made me super excited about where this is all going in the near future. Okay, now nearly all North American cultures have some kind of cultural reference to serpents in the sky or falling stars. Um, but I want to focus on two that have tales that seem to be directly related to the Carolina Bay forming event. Uh, and I'm sure there are others. These are just two that I came across. Uh, the first one is the Ojibwa tribe of the upper Great Lakes region. Um, and what makes this story so fascinating to me is the ancestors of the Ojibwa were likely the first settlers of this area after the cosmic impact took place and reshaped the entire area. Uh, they were likely refugees from the coastal areas uh, that were quickly being inundated by rising sea levels as they headed inland to find answers. Now, their story is actually about a comet named Jananandawayanung, uh, which meant long-tailed heavenly climbing star. Uh, the comet came so close to the earth that it literally cooked everything, including the rocks and the giant animals. Uh, supposedly, their their Holy Spirit warned the survivors that um, uh, they were able to avoid being cooked alive by burying themselves in a bog and covering up with mud. Um, their culture now treats all comets and meteors as serious omens and uh, that need to be interpreted by shamans. So, so this is serious stuff. Uh, now, this tribe, the the Wakama, uh, or, I'm sorry, Wakama, uh, has a really interesting story that just so happens to focus on one of North Carolina's most well-known Carolina bays, Lake Wakama. Uh, legend states that an immense meteor brighter than the sun appeared in the night sky thousands of years ago from the southwest. Now, once the meteor finally struck the earth, the burning crater was filled in by the surrounding swamps and rivers. Now get this, the color of the newly formed lake was gem blue verdant green. Now that's an oddly specific color and just so happens to be the same color as uh, glacial meltwater lakes and uh, like, like this one here. Um, another interesting coincidence is that the Waccamaw um, tribe powwow is held annually in late October. Uh, which just so happens to line up with the torrid meteor shower, the Day of the Dead, all that other stuff. So, oh, and did I mention that the word Wakama itself translates to the people of the falling star? Okay, guys, you know, I better wrap it up there. Uh, this is pretty much the conclusion of my presentation on the formation of the Carolina Bays. Um, as I mentioned before, up till now, I've been pretty much presenting other people's work uh, and ideas trying to gain public awareness. Now, over the next few months, I'll be taking a page right out of Antonio Zamora's handbook and getting some of my own ideas about the aftermath of this event down in writing and possibly even published. Uh, one of the first topics I want to tackle and bring it a little closer to home for me is connecting the formation of the Okefenokee Swamp to the Younger Dryas causing impact. Uh, did I mention that the word Okefenokee translates to the land of trembling earth? <laughs> uh, this should be interesting. Uh, now, other than a few papers for my master's in geoscience, um, this type of writing is something new uh, that I'm dabbling into. So if any of you have any experience in writing scientific research papers you know, and or journal articles, I would certainly welcome your tips and ideas. Uh, now, with that, Thanks for watching, guys, and as always, please feel free to message me in the comment section below uh, or shoot me a line at dabbler.den at gmail.com. Okay, guys, see you next time. Bye.